Hey there, Fiber Junkies! I'm Johanna, the owner and dye goddess behind Potion Yarns. You can find my hand-dyed yarns and fiber in the link below in the description box. It's www.potionyarns.com. You can also connect with me on social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram as Potion Yarns, and those links are also going to be below this video in the description box, and you can find those links on my profile as well. So today I wanted to invite you to join me on this new adventure that I'm starting. Today marks my one year anniversary. This is December 27th, 2017. One year ago today in 2016, I launched my website and opened potionyarns.com uh, for sales to the public and started actually officially being able to take in sales and um, launch my new business of these hand dyed yarns and fiber. It was so, so exciting and I'm thrilled that I've made it to one year and that I'm still going strong and I think I've made more progress in the first year than I was anticipating so that's really exciting. And I'm really excited to share this next year with everyone. So I thought today was a fitting day to start my YouTube channel. I've been thinking about this for several months and decided this was a great time to launch this video channel which is going to be called Potion Yarns Color Cauldron. So in the Color Cauldron you can expect to find knitting tips and tricks, how to work with hand dyed yarns, little uh, tidbits about what make my yarns unique and things that are coming to my shop updates. We'll be talking about really anything yarn related, answering your questions. I'm going to show a couple things that I've been working on um, when it comes to interesting techniques or um, interesting new ideas of ways to do things, etc. And uh, just really delving into the world of finer yarns, hand dyed yarns, luxury fibers, etc. Helping us to just appreciate that a little bit more. And I also want to share with you some of my crossover inspiration of where I get some of my inspirations for colors and how I um, come up with my own techniques to dye yarn. So for those of you that don't know, I started as a hairstylist. I've been doing hair for 12 years professionally and I absolutely love it. I specialize in vivid and fantasy hair colors and hand painted techniques like balayage and uh, more advanced hair coloring techniques. And I also uh, love doing special occasion styles, retro and vintage hairstyles, those kinds of fun things. So I really love color. It makes my world go round, it makes me happy, it calms me down, it excites me, it's the best of everything, and my life isn't complete until there's color everywhere, and lots of color. So after doing hair color for 12 years, I started to feel a little bit like I was just getting in a rut and I just kind of needed to try something new. I still loved going to the salon, but I didn't necessarily want to go every single day. And about that same time, my husband had asked me to um, knit him a very specific project. He wanted a wizard hood with an attached cowl, and he wanted it in the colors of a mixed media painting I had done for him. And it was kind of a galaxy themed colorway um, based on blacks, swirling blues, purples, red. It was very, very deep and um, very intricate colors. So I scoured the internet, scoured my local yarn stores looking for yarns that would adequately express the colors and the mood of the piece and I just couldn't find anything I was happy with. So in frustration I told him I didn't know that this project was going to happen. And he said, well why don't you just paint yarn like you paint hair? Can't you just color it like you color somebody's hair? I know you could create these colors in a hairstyle. And I was like, no you can't just paint yarn like you paint hair. It's not the same thing at all. And then I started thinking and I was like, maybe Maybe it's more similar than I'm realizing, and why can't I paint yarn if I paint hair? I mean, it's got to be easier because it's not still attached to a living object's head, so it surely can't be that difficult, right? And in worst case scenario, if I mess it up, I just throw it away. I don't have to try and fix it and send home a crying client if, if their hair's messed up. So I started researching and found out about the different types of chemicals and products and processes that you can use to dye yarns and different types of fiber and... Um, I felt pretty confident that I could do it and I also felt like even though I didn't really know what I was doing I felt like I had a little bit of a good background because of my hair dyeing experience that I could translate a lot of those same techniques and that same knowledge of color into my dyeing of yarn. So never one to do things by half measure. I jumped right in and my very first uh, yarn that I dyed was a variegated skein with um, four colors. I did black, purple, blue, and red and I hand painted it in different sections and I pulled it out of uh, the dye pots when I was finished and I didn't like it very much. I My heart kind of sank and I was like this just 
really wasn't what I expected. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist too. If you don't know that about me yet, you will learn that if you keep watching my videos. And I talk about how easily upset I get when things aren't perfect. Um, especially when I'm the one doing them. I, I don't tend to be that picky with other people, but I'm really hard on myself. And so I was very upset. So in frustration, I threw the whole thing into a pan and mixed up some more purple dye and just started squishing purple dye into the yarn all over. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know this was an actual technique and I didn't know like what I was doing. I just was mad and was just trying to put more color into it. And I thought, well, when hair color doesn't come out the way I want, I layer colors and I put what's called toners or glosses or fillers, depending on what I'm doing. I put those kinds of um, colors over it um, and I layer colors, I mix colors, etc., until it looks right. So I started squishing more purple into it, processed it again, pulled it out. Okay, that's looking a little bit better. So long story short, I was able to do it and I thought I would show you my first ever hand dyed yarn because I did dye up several skeins of it, like six skeins of worsted weight, and knit him this wizard's hood. It's huge. I don't know if you can see in this video how long this massive thing is. So here's the hood part. I will model for you. You put it on like this, and there's this big point down the back, and then either side is attached to a cowl, and that goes nice and long. And you can wrap it around multiple times. My husband is um, six foot three, and he wanted it to be long enough that he could wrap around multiple times and have a really big bulky cowl, or he could just wrap it once and then leave a nice long piece hanging down. So it went on for forever, but um, I don't know if you can see these colors too well, but I didn't do too terribly for my very first time. This is a brioche cable um, on the on the cowl part. So you can see there's some flashes of blue, there's um, purple, there's red, and then there's black. And that was my first ever dyed yarn. Really not too bad considering it was my very first one and I basically was going off of like a YouTube video and a couple blog posts that I found online and then just intuition. So um, I ended up loving it even though I wasn't 100% excited about the results, I ended up loving it more than I thought I would. So I purchased a few more skeins of berry yarn and a few more dyes, and I decided I'll give this a little bit more of a try. So I started reading everything I could find on dyeing yarn, looking up every video I could find. I started just playing around. I um, My very first skeins uh, from the hood, I did dyeing in the oven. So I'd mix up dye solutions, paint the yarn, put them in the oven, and let it sit um, with the heat to set it, um, and then rinse it out. I then started playing around with the crock pot. I tried the crock pot method that I saw on YouTube, and um, had iffy results with it. I didn't love it, but it was okay, not bad. Um, so I just kind of kept playing around with stuff and became fully obsessed. At about a few months in, maybe two two months after I started, it's so not very long, one of the indie dyers that I really enjoyed her work and had purchased from her before, she posted that she was doing um, some dyeing classes online, so she was looking for guinea pigs to be in her very first dyeing class and kind of give her feedback on um, her as a teacher and what other resources we would need and what we wanted included in the class or things that she could leave out for the next time, etc. So I joined up to be one of her guinea pigs and took a dyeing class from her and that was really helpful because it was a great way to get started with someone who had a lot of experience. I got the chance to ask her personal one-on-one -on -one questions and really delve deeper into a lot of the techniques and a lot of the, um, the side of it that I was a little bit less familiar with. Um, and she was very helpful because she taught some specific techniques that she uses and gave us some good jumping off points to get started, but there was a lot of creativity and personal expression encouraged in her class so that we were able to really create our own recipes and start to develop our own style. And what was fun for me in that class was I really liked seeing how, I don't remember how many people were in the first class, probably eight to 10, something like that, but it was really fun to see how she would give us a recipe for homework to do one week and would give us um, a recipe she'd created and say, you know, go create this thing, use these colors, whatever. And then she would give us um, an assignment to 
go create your own recipe and the technique we're working on is how to create shadow um, so using darker tones to create some uh, real dimension between the colors creating light and shadow in your skeins or we're working on speckles this week go create a new speckle that's different from the recipe that I gave you and everyone of course, everybody's unique recipes were different. I expected that, but I expected our recipes that she gave us straight up and said, just go recreate this to be a lot more similar. And one of the things that I took away from that class was you can give a room full of 10 dyers the exact same yarn, the exact same dyes, the exact same recipe and proportions, and the exact same tools and techniques, and you can come up with 10 different colorways. And that right there is exactly why I fell in love with Indie Dyed Yarn. Because every single person's yarn and fiber is 100% unique to them. It's always going to look different when I dye a skein. It's going to look different than when Kathy over here dyes a skein. It's going to look different than when Shelly over here dyes a skein. We can all use the same colorways, the same recipes, and come up with something different. So then imagine most of us don't use the same recipes or techniques or the same dyes or the same yarns necessarily and we can go and create all of these different things and if you buy a skein of my yarn nobody else is going to be able to recreate that that's why i buy from other indie dyers all the time even though i have my own beautiful yarns at home and i love to work with my own yarn so much and it's so fulfilling i still love to buy from other indie dyers because everything that I buy from them is 100% unique and I'm not going to find it anywhere else. And even buying from the same dyer, if I buy one skein from her and then I go back and order the same colorway a couple months later, it's not going to be exactly. It'll be close enough, but it's not going to be exact. There's going to be little tiny differences that will make each one a special work of art. So if you really love unique things, you love luxury product, you love having something unique, a total work of art that no one else can recreate and you can't buy in a store, then Indie Dyed Yarn and Fiber is the place for you. You're going to love that everything is so unique, that everything is so special, and that every piece is a work of art that then you can take and create a new work of art. And that's what I love about selling to other fiber artists is it's so much fun for me when one of my customers purchases one of my skeins and they just love the colors and then they go and they knit or crochet or weave or create a mixed media fiber art painting um, or whatever they do with it. They create some piece of fiber art and then share photos of what they've done with my work of art. And it's like a collaboration between artists and it's so beautiful and so exciting. So thank you guys for letting me be part of that. Thank you to everyone who's purchased uh, yarns and fiber from me. Thank you for sharing your photos and please continue to do so. If you go and purchase something, please show me what you're working on because I love to see the works of art you guys create. So that's kind of how I got into it. Um, from the class after that ended, I continued to um, just perfect and hone my techniques. And at first I started out using a lot of the techniques I learned in class, plus a few others that I was learning on my own. Um, a lot of my techniques have very similar, um, very similar styles to the way that I dye hair, which is not surprising. Um, and so there's definitely some techniques I've tried that just feel completely foreign to me and I just can't seem to make my hands work right and the dyes don't come out right and other ones like hand painted yarns and, um, and speckles and things just come so easily because they remind me so much of what I do at the salon every day. So that's been a lot of fun for me and I noticed that the longer I kept doing it, the more I strayed from the class that I originally took and I used a lot of the principles and a lot of the information I learned in that class and some of the exact techniques she taught, I'll take a few little things from that technique but I've shifted how I do it so I'm not even really doing it like her anymore, I'm doing it more of my own style, which was the whole point anyways. So that's a, a great way to do it. So from there I just ended up launching my website and over the last year I've just been focusing on growing my sales, growing my social media to reach more customers and just helping people get familiar with who I am. And that's kind of why I wanted to start this YouTube channel. I really wanted to let you guys see a little bit more of who I am behind the yarn. And it's a little bit scary for me because to be perfectly honest, I'm pretty weird. And I talk way too much and I talk way too fast. And I think my voice is really high and squeaky and weird. And I can be a little bit perfectionistic at times and not enough perfectionistic enough at other times. And I'm just kind of dorky and weird. I have weird tastes and interests. I have weird sense of humor. So I'm a little nervous about letting you guys in. But I really want to because I really think that's what makes our community really awesome. As I've gotten more involved in the fiber world over the last year, 
I have been so excited to find out that a lot of the other fiber crafters are beautifully weird people as well. And I finally fit in somewhere because I finally feel like I found a tribe that loves that I have crazy blue hair and they love that I laugh at things that other people don't think are funny and they totally get me when I said, you know what, I did want to go to that party but I was really sad that I had to leave my knitting and I don't understand why we don't just allow knitting at every single social event ever and I'm trying to make it happen. I take my knitting to parties now and things like that. They get it and they don't think I'm weird or that I'm rude because I'm knitting in the meeting or whatever. So thank you guys for opening up and letting me see your weirdness and I hope you're ready for the ride of your life because we're going to get kind of weird on Color Cauldron. Hopefully not too weird. Okay, so now I wanted to share with you guys a few tips that I had because another question I get asked all the time is, oh my gosh, I love your story and I think it's so cool that you got into dyeing and you've only been doing it for a year and a half, two years now, but how do I get started? Or I'm really wanting to dye just for myself as a hobby. What, what can I do? Or I'm wanting to start a business. What can I do? So disclaimer, here's what I don't share. I don't share my sources. I don't tell people where I get my dyes and yarns. Honestly, it probably isn't that hard to figure out. If you do some Google searching, you can find suppliers, and uh, there's only a handful that sell to indie dyers anyways, so you can probably figure it out if you really want to. But as I mentioned before, if you take the exact same yarns I use, the exact same dyes I use, and even my exact recipes, it's gonna turn out differently. And I'm also not giving out my exact recipes, so you're on your own there. So. I don't really feel the need to share those with you because that's not the key to your success. I can give you the best supplies in the world and you can still make crap yarn if you don't know what you're doing and you don't practice and you're not really loving what you do and you don't put passion and education into it. I can also give you crappy yarn, I can give you really low quality food coloring dyes which aren't even the same types of dyes that I use in my business but I can give you just you know some food coloring and some crappy dye and let you go and if you uh, if you have the eye for color and you've educated yourself and you practice you can create gorgeous yarns so it's not really about the supplies it's about the education and how you use them so I'm not going to share those and I don't share a specific techniques I'm not going to take you into my kitchen and show you my dye recipe book so don't bother asking but here's what I do want to share with you I want to share first of all encouragement the one thing that I want to tell you if you are dyeing yarn whether for a hobby or for a business is that Everybody makes crap yarn sometimes, and that's okay. Nobody is going to care if you make crap yarn. This isn't brain surgery. No one is going to die. So the worst thing that happens, the absolutely worst thing that happens, is you feel embarrassed that you made crap yarn, and you shovel it into the trash can before anyone can see it. But that's only the very last case scenario after you've tried everything else. Usually if I pull out crap yarn, and this happens to me all the time, I get a great new idea. I put a dye recipe in, I pull it out all excited, and it looks like crap. And I'm embarrassed and I think I could never show this to anyone, much less ask them to pay me money for it. So my next attempt is to just keep working on it. Keep adding dyes, keep trying new things. Usually you can over dye yarns, um, or you can add more yarns, or you can add speckles, or you can hand paint over it or something, and you can create something better. Um, worst case scenario, you try several things and it's getting to the point where all the colors are starting to look muddy and mucky and it's not really looking at all great. You can either donate it to a thrift store or a charity knitting program if it's not too horrible, or if it's too bad even for that, throw it away. It's not that, it's not the end of the world. So, we are going to, um look at a couple other tips that I had as well, but my first one was just an encouragement that everybody makes crap yarn, it's okay. It's not the end of the world, just try over dyeing, try throwing it away, have a cocktail and try another day. Well, well hey, that kind of rhymes. I should create a rhyme for that. The weirdness has already started to come out. Now I've got a rhyme for what to do with crap yarn. Okay, so my next tip is don't ask other indie dyers for their recipes, their supplies, their processes, or to teach you. Generally, if they are open to teaching, they will have a way of letting you know. If you get on their website or um, contact them and ask for like resources or something like that, they will have a way of letting you know, oh, I teach online classes, or oh, I teach at this place. If you're local, I have this place that I teach at, or they'll give you other resources. Um, but it's very irritating when you're trying to run a business and you're a one-woman person to have someone being like, hey, can I come over and watch you dye yarn? Nope, that's not something that we offer. Usually it's not um, safe or a good idea for insurance purposes. 
Um, most of us are dying out of our home or a very small studio space, and so it's not really set up for visitors. So don't ask them that. Use Google. Use your library. Use um, the myriad books out there and find ways um, to research on your own as much as you can and look for classes that are already offered because there are some. Craftsy has classes on dyeing yarn. Um, there's other dyers. Uh, Creative Live, I believe, has some. There's a couple different places out there. You can uh, go check. You can Google yarn dyeing classes and I'm sure you'll come up with some. So try that as well. My next tip is going to be use other art sources not just dyeing yarn. Don't just Google dyeing yarn. Look for art classes. Look for color theory classes. Go to your local community college and take a basic intro to color theory class or an intro to art appreciation class. Anything you can do to learn about art, about color, in any form is going to help you as a dyer. Every single dyer that I know uses non-yarn and fiber sources to inspire their colorways. They're inspired by nature. They're inspired by films, books, paintings, mixed media, textile arts, weavings, um, trips to the museum to see ancient artifacts. They're inspired by their son's little scribbles. Um, they're inspired by their grandma and a story she told. They're inspired by all these other things. So don't just think you need to look in the yarn world. Go outside and appreciate other forms of art. And that's another great way to develop your color sense as well. Another tip is when you're getting started, if you think you want to go into business but you have never done it before, don't spend too much money. I can't say this enough. I thankfully was really good at dipping my toes in so I didn't get myself in loads of debt. So my new business has done really well because I didn't have a big fat credit card bill. I didn't have a lot of debt. I didn't get any kind of loans or anything. Um, and that was huge for me. And I can't tell you how many times I have debated over a purchase, held off on it, and then realized I didn't actually need it. And it's so tempting when you first get started to jump in there and be like, I want to make this into, I dyed like two skeins of yarn, I think I want a business. And no judgment if that's you because that was 100% me. Literally, first skein of yarn I dyed, I was like, I'm going to start selling this. I just know it, I'm going to make a business. Um, don't just jump in though when you're all excited and you've just dyed two skeins of yarn and it went well and you're like, I can totally do this, I have a gift. Don't go put $3,000 on the credit card and just buy everything that you think you need for a business. You don't have to have the newest and best products and techniques. You don't need to have 30 hundred skeins of yarn, 30 hundred, that's like 3,000, right? You don't need 300 skeins of yarn even, much less 30 hundred. Um, you don't need everything up front. Start small. Start small and my favorite resource, I will give you this one, my favorite resource for starting is Knitpicks. Knitpicks.com, they have, there's a link below in the description box, they have bare yarn, you can purchase one skein, you can purchase five skeins, you can purchase 25 skeins, as many as you want, but you can, there's no minimum order, so you can just buy one or two, and they also have dyeing kits, and they have tutorials and things, it's a really great way to start out small without spending a ton of money just till you get your feet wet, just till you figure out if A, you really do love it enough to make it into a business and you could see yourself doing this every day, even on the days when you have a migraine and you don't want to do it, and even on the days when you haven't sold anything for three months and you're discouraged and you don't know how to pay your bills. If you think you can still do it then, then you can start investing in larger yarn orders, but don't get into it too early. Start small, just get a few dye colors. You don't need every single color that they have of acid dyes out there. Just get a few, get a wide range, study your color wheel, get a wide range of the basic colors, and then just start with those, just a few. You could probably start with less than 10 colors and still create amazing, gorgeous, rich dimensional skeins. And start with what you have. Look around you. When I started, I got most of my equipment from the thrift store and from um, like Home Goods and TJ Maxx on the discount aisle. Um, I, I even went to Target a couple times and was like, mm, this pan is too expensive, and I'd go to the thrift store until I could find one that I could afford. That's the best way, and I can't tell you how glad I am I started that way, because if I spent a ton of money on a crock pot, I don't ever dye yarn in the crock pot anymore. My first three skeins, well, other than this one, after the wizard hood, my next three skeins were in the crock pot, and I quickly learned that was not a good technique for me. I couldn't control it. I didn't like it. It just wasn't for me. I have friends who dye in the crock pot, and that's all they do, and they do amazing work but it wasn't for me. So thank God that I got a crock pot free from my neighbor who her crock pot was going out and she was like, it still works, but the timer doesn't work. And I was like, I'll take it for free and tried it out. Not for me. 
excellent way to decide that without having to drop $100 on a new crock pot and then find out I don't need it. Because you can never use that for food again. You can't give it to the thrift store because you don't want someone else getting poisoned from your uh, dyeing supplies that you gave to the thrift store. So you basically just have to trash it at that point. So thank God I didn't spend a lot of money on it, right? So always be careful. Dip your toes in slowly, little bits at a time, and grow yourself as you can. And then my other um, tip is kind of for any business owner out there, not just for dyers. And that is do one thing really well instead of 10 things really poorly and inconsistently. And this is not a new concept. It didn't originate with me. I learned it from other people and it's worked out well for me. What I mean by that is take social media, for instance. It's very tempting in this day and age to think that you need to have a Facebook, an Instagram, a Twitter. Uh, you need to have a YouTube channel. You need to have um, Snapchat. You need to have all these other things. There's a million of them and new ones crop up every day. Who can keep up with all of that? And yes, if you expand and you have 10 social media outlets, you are reaching that many more people. You have much more of a wide audience. But is that really what you need? So two pieces of advice with that one. First of all, find out where your customers are. If your customers aren't on Twitter, why do you have a Twitter account? And secondly of all, if you are like most of us entrepreneurs are when we start out, especially in the handmade market, it's a one woman or a one man show, sometimes two people. It's very unlikely that you have an employee when you're starting out anyways, so you're doing everything. You're In my case, I dye the yarn, I do all the marketing, I do all of the photography, editing, etc. My husband occasionally will help me with some of that, but I do the lion's share of it. Um, he did my logo design and designed my business cards and things, and I was so grateful to have that help, but I've literally done everything else. I set up my website and maintain it. I do my accounting. I do everything. Um, I do everything every day. I package yarn. I ship it out, all of it. I don't have time to be constantly educating myself about the new social media and then going out and running it, all doing all of that, plus working on my yarn plus working at the salon that I still need because my business is brand new and I still need that money coming in to help support me. I can't do all of that and still see my family and my husband. So I chose in the beginning to just start very small and I picked two social media outlets. Um, I picked Facebook and Instagram and a year later I still only have Facebook and Instagram and now YouTube. So I'm slowly expanding. I wanted to start a YouTube channel six months ago and I knew I did not have the resources or the time to dedicate to it. So I waited until I could grow my systems that I already had in place to the point where I could expand and add a YouTube channel. So that's for anybody in any business, um, especially the handmade business, choose one thing to do really consistently and really well and then slowly expand if you think that your market is there and your customers are there, okay? So don't think you need to do everything. It's better to have just an Instagram, but post every day consistent quality material than it is to have an Instagram, a Facebook, a Twitter, and a Snapchat, and you maybe post once a week. So make sure that you're putting your efforts where they really do the best in. Okay, guys, that's about it for today. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you for joining me so much. I really appreciate you joining me for my first video, and I hope that you'll continue to check back as I get more comfortable and I have other things to talk about, learn some more stuff to share with you guys. I'm really excited for my next video. We're going to be talking about um, a couple things coming up in the next few videos. I'm going to be showing um, a technique video for how to knit back backwards. Um, it's really helpful for bobbles, entrelock, short rows, and a whole bunch of other things. So we'll be sharing a technique video so I can show you some things I've been working on. I'm going to be uh, sharing with you my new yarn clubs coming up, uh, which are launching in January. And we're going to be talking about just some other uh, questions that I've had from people on uh, both knitting and specifically my hand dyed yarns. Like, how do you get your colors so rich and vibrant? And how do you pick your colors? Where do you get your inspiration from? So we'll be covering those topics in the next couple videos. So please uh, check back. Go ahead and click the subscribe button so that you can make sure you never miss a video and you get all of the updates coming from me. Share it with your friends. Let them know about this new crazy thing called the Color Cauldron and this weird blue haired chick on there who's talking about yarn and fiber. And leave a comment. Let me know what can I do better in the next video. I know that this is my first one, so I'm still not amazing yet. I'm still kind of getting my feet wet, still figuring it out. I would love it if you would just comment though and let me know um, what I can do better in the next video. What would you like to see more of? What would you like to hear about that I didn't cover today? So thank you so much for joining me. It's about time to cast off. Love you.